The Shockwave, The Beast, The Colossus, Grease Lightning, Montezuma's Revenge, and The Barnstormer all have one thing in common. They are all roller coasters designed to provide amusement park customers with bigger and faster thrills. Roller coasters have become the fad of the moment. In 1982, Astro Domain founder Judge Roy Hoffines passed away. Although he was gone, the park he founded 14 years prior was thriving. Waterworld was coming to the Astro Domain, being placed on 15 acres of land just east of Astroworld, a $10 million park that would be separate from its neighbor. Its headline attractions would include Breaker Beach, an 815,000 gallon wave pool, Wipeout, two 60 foot tall, 300 foot long speed slides, Runaway River, an inner tube ride that swirls down 35 feet, and Squirt Splash, a children's area. The water park would also have an 18-hole miniature golf course. But that wasn't all. Astroworld would not be left out. They were introducing the Skyscreamer, a $2.5 million drop tower built by Intamin AG, the same ride Six Flags Over Texas received a year prior. Passengers would sit four across in a gondola, back into an elevator lift, rising up 128 feet at 10 feet per second. That's about three times faster than a normal elevator. It would reach the top, push the gondola out over the track, and drop it down 100 feet, reportedly pulling negative 3.5 Gs on that fall. The track levels out, and the riders are looking at the sky before it lowers back into the station. Astroworld General Manager Lamar Parker called it the smartest thrill ride ever built. Ten years ago, it would have been technically impossible to build. The computer safety systems engineered into the ride are state-of-the-art devices. Safety is paramount, and that's why Waterworld employed 120 certified lifeguards. But on July 12, 1983, Waterworld suffered its first fatality. At 2.15 p.m., a seven-year-old girl was spotted by a lifeguard at the bottom of the pool and was pulled out, but she passed away just an hour later. At the end of that same month, tragedy struck again, this time behind the scenes. On July 29th, at 11.15 p.m., two employees on the Texas Cyclone gave the signal, cleared a dispatch. They didn't know the track had not been returned from the load position to the run position. When that train was dispatched, it rolled backward into a storage shed and off the track, three of the four cars falling 14 feet to the ground, crushing a 22-year-old employee to death and injuring three others. The death was ruled an accident and caused by human error. Lamar Parker said the backup safety mechanism that would have prevented this did not work, and that was because a small wooden board had been jammed into it. The board sent a false signal that the track was in the correct position. The park would rectify this by replacing the current braking system, as well as install bumpers at the end of the storage shed. Less than a month later, the Category 2 hurricane, Alicia, struck the Gulf Coast of Texas. Astroworld escaped the brunt of it, but they prepared by dumping all their lawn furniture into swimming pools. This would keep them from becoming flying missiles. 1983 was a bittersweet year of major additions and major incidents, and at the end of the year, they would bid farewell to several attractions. Alpine Slays was their biggest ticket ride when the park opened in 1968, and now it was being replaced. Same with another park original, La Taxi. Its cars were moved over to spin out and the ride was renamed Antique Taxis. Finally, Whirling Dervish, the Flying Bobs, was removed, but it was replaced with another ride also called Whirling Dervish, this one being a tilt-a-whirl. The River of No Return would not be removed, but it would be renamed the River Ride and become an educational attraction. The park also said goodbye to the Boot Slide and the Barnyard Petting Zoo. The other rides were removed so they can build the Enchanted Kingdom, this replacing the Children's World. This was touted a multi-activity recreational area for kids 3 to 10, combining learning and exercise with playtime. This included an introduction to use a computer. Texas Instruments set up this display, 20 computers total, each one valued between $4,000 and $5,000. The main attraction would be Discovery Mountain, the mountain once used by the Alpine Slays. This had multiple features, including a shadow room, using strobe lights to keep shadows on the wall after the person has moved away. 
Also, the musical tone hallway, where guests can step on lights on the floor to make different sounds. And the body tracer, using computer graphics to capture and display visitors' image on the wall. Its design was to combine education and entertainment. The kids were taken care of, but there was something great for the adults also. To celebrate the 100th anniversary of the invention of the roller coaster, Astroworld would add a brand new one. This one known as XLR8, or Accelerate. This would be an aero suspended coaster, a model they tried three years prior at Kings Island, but had just closed down because of design flaws. They had gone back to the drawing board, and Astroworld was confident enough in their corrections to buy one for the 1984 season. It was meant to give a free floating sensation. Being in an airplane and doing tight turns, gliding over land and water, and quietly touching down as the ride ends. This would cost $3.2 million, standing 81 feet tall, topping out at 34 miles an hour, and covering 3,000 feet of track, all while the train was hanging and swinging under the track. It was a large year of investment for the park, appealing to people of all ages, and they enjoyed a 12% increase in summer attendance over the year prior, topping 2 million people. Lamar Parker said these new attractions Plus, increased awareness of the magnitude of Waterworld. That's making the Astroworld parks a destination for out-of-town visitors. Drawing people outside of Houston was important for the bottom line. And up to this point, they hadn't had much competition outside of Six Flags Over Texas. But right as the season ended, there was a major announcement coming out of San Antonio. Harcourt Brace Jovanovic, the publishing firm that operated three SeaWorld parks nationwide, was set up to invest $75 million and build a 500-acre park called SeaWorld of Texas. This would be much bigger than Six Flags Over Texas and Astroworld, and would be expected to bring in 3 million people each year. With a new major competitor on the horizon, Astroworld had some more immediate problems to deal with. On June 17th, two trains on the 610 Limited Railroad collided. One train was stalled, and because of a communication failure, the other train rear-ended it, sending eight people to the hospital. The engineers are supposed to clear a two-way radio signal before moving to the next stop, but the engineer on the second train thought he had clearance. Moving at 10 miles an hour, it came around the corner, saw the other train parked in the station, put on its brakes, but it was too late. After this incident, the park installed electronic I-beams to prevent this from ever happening again. As 1984 came to a close, the park's longtime mascot, Marvel McFay, would be retired. He was replaced by Bugs Bunny and the Looney Tunes characters. That year, Six Flags acquired Great America in Gurney, Illinois, and part of that purchase included the rights to use the properties of Time Warner and Warner Brothers. The Looney Tunes characters would flood into all the Six Flags parks, the existing mascots being pushed to the side. In 1985, Bugs would be joined by the Chinese acrobats for the entire summer. Their act of hoop diving, acrobatics, tumbling, juggling, leaping, and balancing was said to be unlike anything seen by a Western audience. On June 9th, the park suffered another fatality, this one, once again, in Waterworld. A 30-year-old woman drowned in the wave pool. Lifeguards noted it seemed like she was having seizures at the time that she went under. Her husband pulled her out, but she died an hour later at the hospital. The husband would sue the park a month later, saying the park should have been prepared for emergencies like this. Back at Astroworld, the river ride would be rethemed as Wetlands, the Water's Edge. The ride that was originally The Lost Adventure had gone through numerous changes over the years, and now it would be an educational ride teaching its riders about the importance of the wetlands. The Southern Star Amphitheater would also start bringing in some major acts, like the Grateful Dead, as a live music craze swept all the American theme parks, targeting a crowd that wouldn't be interested in thrill rides or family attractions. Despite not adding anything major, the prior investments over the last two years were still paying off. Park management gave credit to the Chinese acrobats and the arrival of Bugs Bunny to the complex setting a new attendance record, a combined 2.5 million people visiting both parks. At the end of the 1985 season, Lamar Parker stepped down as general manager, replaced by Del Holland, and he was excited to announce everything new coming in 1986. The headline attraction would be the Looping Starship, initially planned to be named the Challenger, but after the accident earlier in the year, it changed to the more generic name. This would swing riders back and forth, until reaching the 84-foot apex, completing 360-degree loops. This would replace Warp 10. They would also bring in the Studio A Dance Club and Fright Night's Halloween event to give the young adults and teenagers something new to sink their teeth into. For the kids and families, they would bring back another Chinese acrobatic group called Chung King and introduce a new show for the Enchanted Kingdom, the Bugs Bunny Circus. The park continued to thrive, reporting a 20% increase in attendance. Playing off their new Fright Night's event, the park would introduce a creepy new show for the 1987 season, A Midsummer Night's Scream, a 30-minute illusion show. After taking a year off, 
Warp 10 would re-emerge as Warp 2000, being located in Plaza de Fiesta, next to the Wetlands ride on the other side of the park. This would also be the final year for this park original, being removed for something new the following year. The park as a whole got a big facelift over the off-season, paving streets, installing new restaurants, and setting up new shows, including the U.S. high diving team at the Lagoon Theater. For two weeks in June, kids could enjoy the Kids Festival, with balloon makers, stilt walkers, clowns, face painting, games, and free cake, along with the world's largest Sunday celebrating Daffy Duck's 50th anniversary. The Texas Cyclone would also look different in 1987, sporting sleek, state-of-the-art Morgan trains for its 10th anniversary. And even 10 years after its debut, coaster connoisseur Robert Cartmel still ranked at number one overall. In the fall, the park would host the Country Jamboree, featuring shows and music from major country artists like Reba McIntyre and the Judds. They would also bring back their popular Fright Nights for the Halloween season, hosting a 5% increase in attendance overall. At the end of the season, they tore down the Wacky Shack, turning it into a season pass processing center. In 1988, Astroworld's new competitor hit the ground running, or should I say, swimming. It is finally here, the opening of Sea World of Texas, simply the biggest marine theme park in the world. And take a look at the crowds that came out today. Thousands of people flocking to see Shamu and friends as Sea World of Texas opened its doors today. When Sea World of Texas opened in San Antonio, it had a price tag of $140 million and covered 250 acres, the nation's largest marine theme park, and it was set to be open year round. Some experts believe that SeaWorld would not hurt the Six Flags parks in Texas. In fact, it would help them. This park completed the Texas Triangle, connecting Houston, Dallas-Fort Worth, and San Antonio. And more tourists than normal would come to Texas and experience all three parks. We Texans had better face the fact that tourism is an industry whose time has come. We have sat back and been dependent on oil and agriculture and haven't needed tourism. And now, all of a sudden, we need it. And we need to market Texas intelligently. Larry Todd director of the Texas Tourist Agency. SeaWorld was also a very different park than Astroworld, focusing on marine life and not rides or even the types of shows that Astroworld offer. By the end of the summer, this came to fruition, and park officials credited SeaWorld for drawing in people who were extending their vacations, making the 215-mile journey east. They finished their first year with an astounding 3.3 million visitors. 70% of the people pouring into Astroworld came from the Houston area, the other 30% came from 300 miles away or further, so anything bringing people to Texas was good for the park. Meanwhile, Astroworld was celebrating its 20th anniversary, introducing Tidal Wave, a shoot-to-shoot -shoot water ride where riders would load into 16 passenger boats, rise up a 65-foot lift hill and plunge down, creating a 20-foot wall of water. For senior citizens, the park brought back the Country Jamboree in the fall, and once again, Fright Nights for Halloween, featuring Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street. But it was a real nightmare that came to the park. On October 22nd, around 11.30 p.m., a 19-year-old was shot in the mouth and was taken to the hospital in fair condition. This was the first shooting in Astro World's history. There were 27,000 people in the park for the first Fright Night when the shooting occurred. There were over 100 security guards on duty. And for the rest of Fright Nights, it was increased by 20, searching bags at the entrance and capping attendance going forward at 20,000 people. Still, these seasonal events proved to be very popular. And at the end of the year, they introduced the very first holiday in the park. This would run daily between Christmas and New Year's, where guests could enjoy ice skating, sledding down Santa's snow hill, and five shows to make up for most of the rides not being operational. The park kept driving forward with major additions into 1989, introducing Viper, a Schwarzkopf looping star. This would not be a new creation. It came from something new Six Flags had introduced in the mid-1980s, the Ride Rotation Program. This served eight seasons at Six Flags Over Mid-America as Jetscreen, being dismantled and moved south to Astroworld. Riders would board the train, rise up 80 feet, diving into a tunnel called the Viper Pit, into a vertical loop, and twisting around almost 2,000 feet of track. The ride was made to be portable, transplanted on a small plot of land in the oriental section of the park. For those who couldn't stomach the new Viper, Astroworld also brought in a new show called Stars of the USSR, a Russian troupe performing folk songs and dances. Del Holland said, We, as a nation, have a curious appetite to discover what makes the Russian people tick. In our travels to Russia to put this show together, we discovered there is an incredible sense of pride incorporated in Russian dance and music. It is truly an incredible performance. The stars of the USSR was popular, along with Viper, helping overcome the drop in attendance due to bad weather. 
This was coming from Tropical Storm Allison and Hurricane Chantal. By the end of 1989, Six Flags Over Texas was already building the world's largest wooden coaster, the Texas Giant. Not to be outdone, Astroworld spokeswoman Deborah Ford hinted at something new coming at the turn of the decade. All she would say is, it's gonna be a great thrill ride. There will be no other ride like it in the world when Alter Twister, Astroworld's new revolution in roller coasters, twists and moves March 10th at the opening of the 1990 season. That was the pitch from the park for their new Togo Alter Twister, a coaster without any turns, just a straight line from front to back, located on the western edge of the park. Guests would climb up 92 feet, drop straight down at 85 degrees, and pop back up, going into a 360 degree rotating turn forward. It would then hit a transfer track to dip down below, sending the train backwards, and it would do two more rotating turns before the ride ended. Unlike a normal coaster, where the track is either above or below the rider, the track would encompass the rider on all sides. Like Viper, this was not an Astro World original. This operated as Six Flags Great Adventure for three seasons starting in 1986, featuring a vertical lift that was changed to a 45 degree angle once it was moved. This ride's design mimics aerobatic stunts, but even fighter pilots can't do barrel rolls backwards. Janet Wilson, Austin American Statesman. For the kids, the park would have a season-long celebration of Bugs Bunny for his 50th birthday, adding two new shows in honor of Bugs, and offering kids admission for half of the adult price. 2.3 million people came through the gates during the summer season, a 17% spike over the prior year. The park continued to tweak its popular Fright Nights, adding two new haunted houses, a Scream in the Dark, and Dungeon of the Mysterious. They also extended their Holiday in the Park event, initially lasting the final week of the year, now having a 25-day schedule from Thanksgiving to New Year's Eve. 1990 also marked the end of the Studio A Dance Club, serving the park for just four years, and the Whirling Dervish, the Tilt-A-Whirl in the Coney Island section of the park. This plot of land would be used for the park's new for 1991 edition, the Condor, a Hus Condor. Riders would sit in 28 bird-shaped cars, rise up 60 feet, and swing around while spinning. This was also a recycled ride, this time from Six Flags Magic Mountain. And before it even opened, the park announced it would be removed after the 1991 season, heading off to its next stop. To add to the thrill, the park would also partner with the Houston Zoo, putting on an endangered species display inside the ride house, featuring the California and Indian condors, giving the ride an educational angle. Following the theme of offering something for everyone, the park would also introduce Blast, the most elaborate and unique puppet show in the world, featuring a cast of 175 marionettes and life-size celebrity puppets. After Fright Nights and Holiday in the Park were over, there would be two developments that would prove to be pivotal in the future of Astroworld. In the last week of the year, Time Warner bought Six Flags. Wesray Capital was the current owner, buying the chain from Bally Manufacturing in 1987, and from that sale, they were still $610 million in debt. Time Warner, the Blackstone Group, and Wertheim Schrader would infuse $150 million into the company, and this cut down the threat of bankruptcy. Time Warner and Six Flags saw this marriage as mutually beneficial, as Time Warner's dollars would stabilize the chain's finances, and the Six Flags parks could promote Time Warner's characters, most notably those from DC Comics. The other development came in early 1992, when San Antonio opened another major theme park, Fiesta Texas. This was owned by USAA, built inside a 100-foot quarry wall. And unlike SeaWorld in the same city that was a marine park, this would be a park in the same vein as Astroworld. In fact, it would open with the world's tallest, fastest, and steepest wooden coaster, the Rattler. This would also feature themed areas and shows, costing $100 million and covering 200 acres. When SeaWorld opened four years prior, it was seen as a positive development for Astroworld. But the events unfolding at the end of 1991 into 1992 would prove to be the beginning of the end. Thanks for watching episode 4 of this 5 part documentary. If you enjoyed it, please drop a like. And if you know anyone who would be interested in the history of Astroworld, I'd appreciate if you shared this with them. This is a major project and I appreciate the support. Stay tuned next week for the final episode, as this once bright shining star begins to fade away, and we uncover the factors that led to the death of Astroworld.